morning. This is uh, the mid-semester meeting of the field instructor, the field experience instructors. Today we've got a lot of, of different things going on and I may rearrange. Dr. Garcia came in and, and then she had to run out for a minute so we may go and skip that. I have a couple of introductory thoughts I'd like you to think about because your jobs are so important. Um, I've been reading some work on count of coaching and and uh, supervision and these stood out. Coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. And I see you guys as the first coaches that these students get in the classroom, so it's really important. And then the other thing is we all want our students to be successful, star athletes type, but sometimes we have to be very blunt with them and that's important. Come on in, sign in please. When you have, fail to have courage and honesty with your colleagues about their true developmental score for an element, you rob them of the opportunity to grow. And I'm, I put that quote on, not to say give them all U's, but that especially at midpoint, we want them to see the potential for growth. And we want not to make that shiny silver star automatic, that they have to work for it. So what are we going to do today? First of all, welcome. And the overview is that Dr. Garcia will be in here in a minute, and she will tell you her uh, material, her information on the administration and the things that are going on within the university and the system. Uh, Dr. Bunda will then talk to you about CPDT and other issues. TEA and future documentation concerns that we have, um, midpoint evaluation overviews and all your paperwork, paperwork requirements. And finally, um, uh, this will be in a couple of places, but this is a reminder of your final meeting with me in December on the 9th in C210. You've already got the room. It's on the other side of this floor. And it will be from 1 to 2.30, where you'll turn in all your folders. Yes, I know some of you may not be finished, and we'll talk about that later. Okay. So, Dr. Garcia, welcome. I'll let you come up and we'll talk to us. So you get out of your way. It is a small group you have here. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's an important group. So anyway, I just wanted to give you uh, an update on some of the things that are happening in the department and how you can help us with some of those things. So just being here and just helping our students is important. So we want to thank you and appreciate you for that. I don't know how much uh, Susan uh, or Dr. Bundock have told you over the year, but we have, and I, I, I remember that I spoke with you uh, in the spring, so one of the challenges that we've had in the department is our enrollment. We, you know, there are lots of things that have happened either in the economy or in previous years' employment or non-employment of teachers in school districts. So uh, whatever the factors, whatever the case, uh, we have experienced lower enrollment than in previous years. Uh, and so we are working really, really hard. The provost has really been working with us, with some of the student services uh, offices in the university to help us. We have a number of recruitment events. We have information meetings for students to declare uh, their um, uh, major with us. We're working with the financial aid office to make sure that our future candidates know about loan forgiveness and a few other pieces that we have not ever made students aware of. Uh, but so in thinking about you and how you might be able to help us, obviously the students that you're working with are already in our program. Uh, and we have a very good retention rate. Once they declare in our program and begin PD-1, they stick it out because that, that very organization, the organization that they're in, the cohort nature of our PD uh, sequences really allows for us to support them, the faculty to support them, for you to support them when they're out in the field and for them to support each other. The students call on each other because they're in PD-1 together, they're in PD-2 together, and, and quite often those bonds really helped uh, solidify some of the things, uh, you know, some of the, the experiences that they have uh, and, and kind of forges, you know, a, another person or another way in which they, they present challenges and help each other. So in that regard, how you can help is to continue to be supportive. I know that quite often, you know, Susan talks about 
you know, this is the schedule we want students to have uh, done the, the first observation by this period of time. We have an expectation that students are learning from us that there are going to be deadlines in schools and obviously we present those time frames because students are going to have those time frames in school. Uh, when they turn in lesson plans, when they do all the number of things that they do when they're employed. Uh, and so then you do it again when you have the second observation. You have a time frame and you expect students to let you know the day and time. And sometimes that gets a little rattly. Some students, you know, just really, in PD1 especially, are very hesitant because it's their first experience. They're very nervous about it. Sometimes they've had a change in mentor assignment or you know, different things happen. So the only thing that we ask you uh, is to be as flexible as, as you can. Uh, if there is a time frame, and Susan has shared that with you, uh, listen to the students. Sometimes they have, you know, they're just trying to postpone it, and we know that, but at other times they have very legitimate reasons. You know, uh, remember that our students are quite challenged sometimes financially, they may be the very first one in their family to go to college or to the university. Their parents and family don't understand why their child is not at home helping them, taking them to the doctor, doing all the family things they need to do, and why it is that they have to run off and go work on this lesson plan and this requirement, you know, it's particularly for some families. So just be flexible, just extend uh, your ear a little bit more. We want to, um, to continue to retain the students once they are in the program. The other thing that we do know is that students talk with each other. And so they will say, oh, you know, this was a great experience or this was a bad experience. And sometimes, you know, those experiences are between those two poles. But if students are very, very uh, frustrated, they don't feel that we are being flexible enough to allow for those challenges or those differences, it really causes them a, a lot of stress. They talk among themselves. Not only do they talk among themselves, they may talk to students who are coming behind them. Uh, and so we really don't want to have students uh, have the impression that our program is so rigid and so inflexible that it's going to cause them a great deal of stress or frustration in their lives. They have their own families. They have to get their young children to school. They have, you know, their, their job or their work because uh, they have to kind of secure some money before they start student teaching. Uh, and so just listen. And sometimes, as I said, the excuses will be an attempt to postpone something that they should go ahead and do right now. But in, in, in some very real cases, the students may be struggling and they, we just need to, to be flexible enough to listen to them, uh, to hear them out so that we are you know, promoting our program in a positive light. I'm there to support you, I'm there to help you, we're there to do the same thing, uh, but to just kind of guide them along in a gentle sort of way. So that is just uh, uh, to give you a sense of some of the struggles uh, that students have. You know, they, they have uh, vehicles that don't work well. Sometimes, you know, they don't have the money to repair the vehicle. So many of our students, some of our students ride the bus. Uh, so to get from one place to another is a challenge. Uh, they may or may not have the technology or the computer access. They have to come to campus to come write out the lesson plan and do those sorts of things. Or sometimes they've driven halfway across town because a friend of theirs that's in their PD1 <coughs> section has a computer that they can use <coughs> in time for them to submit their lesson plan. So uh, just know that um, we're behind you in the sense that they must complete the, those lesson plans. They must submit them to the teacher, they must submit them to you in a timely way so that you can give them feedback. But we still, you know, want to, we want, so we want to, you know, adhere to those uh, time frames, but with flexibility if we need to. So, are there thoughts or questions or examples that you have about something like that, Patricia? Well, one of the things that I have observed is, and in fact, I just had a meeting with a student and she brought that up, is, and I know that the, the University has certain uh, districts yes, that yes, they yes, collaborate yes, yes. with. Yes, yes. But like for some students, it, the, the schools are so far away. And like you said, some of them don't have their yes. transportation. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we do have a contractual memorandums of understanding with 10 school districts. Mm -hmm. And for PD1 and PD2, 
the placements are, are assigned. Dr. Bundock works with uh, the school districts mm -hmm. and with the principals in those school districts quite often with the human resource officers. And so when the students register, part of it is, uh, is advising and guiding the students because the students could register for a section closer to the northwest area, for the Kingwood <coughs> area, or those that meet closer to the UHD area. And that general, the ones here generally are Galena Park, uh, sometimes Aleaf, Aldine. So we have a mixture of students coming together. Part of what has happened because of the lower enrollment, if we, we've reduced, is that we've reduced the number of cohort options. So where before, when our enrollment was at the highest, we had very healthy sections scattered throughout town and students could choose an option that was closer to their home. Because we've reduced options uh, and they have to come downtown, then we do have students that come from um, uh, Crosby or you know further north of Humble, and they're happy to come all the way in. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only thing that I would say to students is, you know, it's part of our program. Now, one thing that we can be very flexible about, uh, and I know Susan has shared this with you, is that we're, the requirement is that they complete 60 hours of field work. Uh, so that is the requirement. And from our perspective, they can do six hours a week for a 10-week period as long as they've talked with their mentor. Their mentor is in agreement uh, with the time frame. We are not saying to any candidate, you must do your uh, field-based assignment only on Monday and, and Friday or only on Tuesday and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday. We say to the student, you have a life, a schedule, home, you know, things that you're responsible for talk with your mentor as long as your mentor agrees that the six hours that you're, that you're agreed on for the week entails opportunities for you to, to, to uh, practice and to have experiences with children. So, you know, not three hours of your kids are at lunch, or PE, music, you know, those sorts of things, but where the, this, our students are really experiencing instructional sorts of activities. So if that helps the students, that's something that we want to continue to do because, you know, if we, we, we could be so rigid that we could say to the students, you're coming only on Monday. Well, they may have a part-time job. And if they lose that part-time job on Monday afternoon that doesn't allow them to save money for student teaching, then we, we, may, we may lose them. They may say, I don't want to do the Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies and complete the field-based component. I'll just go get my degree as a Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies, and heaven knows how, I want to still want to be a teacher, but I'll somehow end up in an ACP program and go back and get my certification. So those are the kinds of things that we need to think about. Are we causing students to say, you know, this is too much, I can't handle it, I can't do it, especially because they're unbending and they're not, they're not listening to me and they're not helping to accommodate my schedule. Something else that's come up is almost the opposite end. If I um, have a student who maybe she's failing four of the seven criteria because of I don't have a computer, I don't have a car, yes. I'm not making it on time, I'm not informing this, yes, I'm going across, yes. all of that. And we want to help be flexible, but if at the end of the semester she still is not meeting that, they're holding yes, her back isn't going to change her situation. Right, right, right. But at the same time, if we put her forward, students do talk. And yes. then it gets back again that yes. don't really worry about that right. because they'll pass you in the end. And I'm not saying we should or should not let her go on. No, no, no. This is the important. It's, it's tough to find that in between a flexibility. Well, and this is the importance of this meeting. Susan right. has called this meeting at a time and place during the semester where you're at about the midpoint. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bundock is here as well because for those students, our intent is not to let them kind of continue in this world of um, uncertainty but to come in and meet with us, to meet with Dr. Bundock, to meet with you and meet with Susan to say, let's develop a plan. Right. You know, and in, in the work world out there, we know that as a growth plan. But it is, in fact, a way for us to say and listen to them so that maybe we can make an adjustment of some sort that allow the student to be successful. It's our goal. You know, all of, you know, we want our students to begin the semester and end the semester successfully. And then at the end, if they don't go through with that plan, Yes, 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 but we don't want to wait. It's not, we do not want to find out about that case one week or two weeks before breaks are due. Right. That's why at midpoint, we should intervene. If there's anyone struggling that does not have a check by all seven, obviously they don't have a check by the 16 hours yet, but 
you know, if they don't have a, 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 a satisfactory rating right now on any number of those uh, uh, seven criteria, then we need to know now and not wait. Yes. I would say that there's been an interesting conversation. I have two paras, mm -hmm. and they are working with other paras who are looking at our program. Yes. The other parent's response, though, is I don't want to go through the program because I can't afford to lay out a semester yes, yes, to yes, students. Yes, 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 yes. And being the yes. sole provider. Sure. Yes. We've so I think that. at some point we've got to either look at how we change the ACP program to allow those parents who have experiences on the campus mm -hmm. to be waived for those hours, or we're going to have to look at something that will accommodate. Uh, I have one young lady right now who, to make her six hours a week, is having to come in an hour before school. Yes, 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 yes. To make up those hours. And then, because it's a brand new school, she often then gets re pulled because they're having to readjust for enrollments and coverage and right. all that. So, But I think our peers are really, really, really Right, they're students. struggling. Yes, yes, yes. And they're struggling. And we're, we're conducting information meetings now for students who are in line to, to declare. And we want to make sure that they understand ahead of time. This is what the requirement is. We have a wonderfully fabulous field-based program that causes you to rise to the top when you get to that, you know, application time and districts are looking for a teacher. You know, our candidates rise to the top because of the three semesters of experiences. And is it a challenge? It's an absolute challenge. Now, one of the things I do say to all of our students is that we are you know, just like everybody else, even across the nation, the student teaching requirement is a student teaching requirement that we cannot waive. It used to be that we could with the coordinating board educational aid exemption that used to be offered, but we have maybe two or three or four students that still, you know, qualify for that because they were teacher aides and applied for that program some time back. But currently, any student in our undergraduate program must student teach. And in terms of the flexibility for PD 1 and 2, if they're working, uh, that's what I mean. If they're paraprofessionals, uh, they submitted the application and their principal has agreed it's okay. They can do the six hours during the week, during the time that they are, uh, you know, completing the requirements for their teacher aid position and will be flexible and adjust. And in some cases, principals do have them come in before or later to make up those six hours a week. Uh, but it is the student teaching semester, and we recognize that. We right, do. and I don't disagree with that. I just know that there are some it's of those parents who are looking at that there are alternative programs right, right, right. that are the quickest way to get to yes, the dollar. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah, we just need to talk with students. I had an information meeting last week, and a, a young man came in and had his head, his mindset on going to whatever the alternative certification program is that is quick, mm -hmm. as you described. But he hadn't thought of the, of the back end of that actually getting in line after he achieves his certification to, to compete with others for a job. He hadn't thought about, mm -hmm. oh, somebody else with some experience in the schools is going to maybe beat me to that inter internship or that job because yeah. the school districts are looking for somebody that has some experience. So, I mean, we're... we're so, kind of what, you know, so what should we be telling these parents? Because Casey and I talked about this before because unfortunately, one of, we talked about part of the reason why the enrollment may be down is because at Lone Star, when we started that articulation, I mean, that's who yeah. we were targeting to because it was great for them, you know? And so because that avenue is not there, that may be partially why the enrollment has gone down here because we were sending, Lone Star was sending lots of people and a lot of more parents, yeah. absolutely. And just the whole, yeah, the yeah. whole aspect of that. So, so like what he's saying, I mean, what, we, have, we really, our hands are tied, as okay. are the hands of other preparation programs. We all across the nation, you know, uh, have, have that requirement. Our students, if they're in an under, undergraduate program, must complete student teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, you know, so what we, t you know, the best thing we can do is tell them ahead of time, so it's not a surprise when they get to PD2, that, right. oh my gosh, you mean I can't work the next semester, the entire semester? So we're telling them way ahead of time, right. and sometimes you're absolutely right. These are the sole providers in their home, and to take off a semester and not work, it, I mean, it, it, I, I don't know how they do it. I'm mean, just totally amazed at how some of them do manage to do it, but we, our hands are tied. Because I think a lot of them, too, I mean, cause, I mean, we all know they're not making tons of money. It's the benefits and just the whole package of being a working person. Yes. 
And then the possible, you know, it was in their mind, there was like, oh, this may just transition into a job. Well, is there another, like, how does that feed into alternative cert? I mean, can we Well, not so let's just say a student decides, so we give them the information and they decide to go through PD1 and PD2 just for the benefit of, of, of having that experience. And they can manage six hours right. a week for mm -hmm. a 10-week period and their work. Uh, but then if they really, really cannot take a semester, uh, the Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies is so broad and so general that those courses will transfer into that degree. They will complete the 120 hours that they need for the degree. They will be uh, they they will receive a degree. They can go back, but it's it's just like Larry says. They have ACP options from here to here. Our ACP option happens to be one that prepares them to be in schools and to work with children and we require that they do PD-1. We want them to have one semester of experience just like our undergraduate students do so they would still go back and do uh, you know that experience. After that, during that semester when they're doing the field experience they would take and pass their content exam. So generalists would take the generalist exam, bilingual generalists would take the bilingual exam, fourth through eight generalists would take that exam. If they're secondary or high school candidates, they would take the math or the science or whatever they want to teach in high school. Uh, and during that semester that they complete the, the PD-1 and the content exam, they would be eligible then the following semester to go seek a paid internship. A paid internship is lining up with everybody else to get the teaching job. It is a teacher of record position except that the state asks us to call it an internship and they do that for one full year. During that year, they, if they're in our program, we continue to support them. We have workshops, we have activities and things that, that they come and do with us. Uh, and after that, uh, during that time, that one year, they also would then take the second of the exams, the PPR take and pass it, complete the internship, boom, you're you know, full-fledged teacher, fully certified. But that internship is a paid internship. So they, you know, if they flipped and did that, uh, they would be uh, earning income. They would be sacrificing PD, you know, some time in PD-1, the six hours in PD-1, but that really is, in, for some of them, that is an answer that is not available during our under, you know, the undergraduate program in student teaching because the student teaching is one full semester of no money coming right. in. Right. And if they do work, they can only work at night or weekends, and we don't really recommend it during student teaching. You know how 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 burdensome that is. But there was a. You're, you're, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to share during our second uh, class session, one of the activities that I uh, have found to be beneficial. Uh, I have the uh, candidates to identify and share reflections on the teacher that had the most positive influence on them, mm -hmm. and then also the one that had the most negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, they were able to see that the ones that were most uh, influential were those that were flexible, mm -hmm. that took out the extra time, that went um, in addition to that basic uh, middle of the road theme. And then also, an opportunity to share from my own personal experiences. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes they look at uh, teachers, yes, university yes. personnel, oh, you all got it all together. Yes, yes. You have never had to Strike. sacrifice and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I could tell from the facial expressions of some of them that this was a troubling thing. Yes, yes. And so uh, where I am, which is a change for me, I'm really no more than 15 or 20 minutes. And so I'm almost on the campus almost every day just to be able to accommodate the schedules that they have. I could tell from some of the spatial expressions in one young lady, I did go up to, after that section, I said, what, what's weighing on you? Uh -huh. And yes, I yes, mean, yes. she really unloaded. And, and I sometimes her, I said, that's all they need. It is, you're going through, I ask you to do just one thing, and that's don't quit. Yeah. And so uh, we've been able to level out. I have uh, one that drives from Tomball to Spring yes. to drop off two babies to the grandmother and then trying to make it to campus. Yeah. And so, um, so far it's worked out. And sometimes just listening. And, yes. and sometimes, just as yes. you said, they've blood it all out. Yes. Somebody knows and <clears throat> somebody's aware of my situation. And cares. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So anyway, so I just want to thank you for what you do and, and that you understand. And 
and you know just continue to support our students because we, we we're amazed so many times we talk about them and we're just amazed at at their tenacity to continue and to and to succeed it's just uh, I mean you just get chills sometimes just thinking about some of their stories but anyway so thank you and work with Susan and again get those students that are in the middle right now struggling right now just because they're struggling right now doesn't mean they're not going to be successful we just need to put in place the the pieces that are going to help them to succeed before the semester's over. Uh, so, um, when, whatever you can do to help us recruit, you know, pass the word along. Yes, UHD has options. Kingwood and the Northwest area, SciFair um, Sci College and UHD Northwest are still options for us and, and here. So, continue to promote that. Uh, Susan will tell you a little bit more. You have all uh, your experience with us, so you know that. There's mandatory training requirements that the university has us go through all of these trainings so that we know FERPA and we know all these things. So there are dates uh, that Susan will share with you if she hasn't already that the training uh, is uh, mandatory and you should be doing it by a set date. Uh, the Blackboard Learn more and more to facilitate communication with our students. That is not an option for any of us anymore. Uh, some students are really, really challenged to, to get com to communicate, uh, and so Blackboard Learn is the standard way in which we not only communicate with students via email or message boards or announcements and things like that, but it is also in in situations like you're describing a way in which we can document and archive. You know, if you're using again your personal email, your Yahoo or whatever other email you use to communicate with your students and we end up with a challenge or, you know, a student, um, you yeah, know. We can print uh, everything out that she's ever com said. You know, so a student promise. complaining or something, we need to be able to archive it because it may be that the student doesn't do it this semester and we come back later. And if you're, we hope that you all are here with us with many, for many semesters, but if for some reason you're not with us, then we're able to retrieve those documents if we need to because Blackboard, Blackboard you know, is a university um, um, function. I mean, we can use that to, to archive and retrieve. So I encourage you to continue to use Blackboard and post, post, post things there. And then also to continue to use the, your UHD uh, email because those mandatory training reminders are, don't come from me and don't come from Susan or Dr. Bundock. They come from uh, the Employment Services Office and so they'll continue to remind you, oh, you haven't completed your mandatory training or there's this new requirement. So please continue to use your UHD email. Yes. And if they have let it go dormant, in other words, in each semester because they're adjunct Yes, level, yes, they're um, reactivated. Yeah. Who, who do they contact or how do they contact to get it reactivated? You just call IT. Like over the summer, it'll cut you right off. But uh -huh. if you just call IT, okay. they get it taken care of. And you can go onto the web page at UHD mm -hmm. to the technology, information technology. They're very helpful. And they respond very quickly. Yeah, they respond very quickly. Really really answer really and answer and they know that yeah. you are an adjunct. Yeah. They have access to that information. So before the end of the day, I'm sure if there's anybody here who doesn't have his or her email activated, they will have it done. Okay. Would you like that November number? When does registration start? Because I know some November fourth. November fourth. November fourth. Because some of my students mm -hmm. brought up they really wanted to be in the climb of the sci fair and it didn't all work out, and so I recommended. Oh my, yes. I'll get the date for you, and you maybe need to November fourth. And they really should. We should guide them. The first day. Yeah. Yeah. We should guide them to be self sufficient mm -hmm. that way. That information has been posted. It's on the. They should. Yes. They should begin to learn. By the but, time they get to us, so they get to the academic calendar. But can they register? No, they need, need to, to, but they, but they know, but they will know. And the the question is, when when can I register? But can they register yes. then because yes. of they we haven't approved them? They have to be clear. Yes, they they'll be cleared before that day. Well, well, they, they should know. go through advising to get cleared. So technically, they, they won't be able to register. Well, but they can begin to process those approval forms. They know, they should know what courses, well, they don't know the CRN numbers yet. Yeah. See, because they haven't finished uh, they haven't finished PD one, so no. But once the schedule is available to them, I looked last night; it's not still not available okay. to students. But once it's available, they should have their degree plan, mm -hmm. 
and they should be checking off the courses that they're taking. What is the next series? What is my PD2? Right. Uh, what are the courses? Uh, they should identify them, locate them on the on the cal on the uh, on e services, mm -hmm. and submit those requests for course approvals. Now they don't have to wait. Okay. Until then, so of course. Now what's going to yeah? Be able to be. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And when can they be? Well, part of, the, part of the dilemma is is that they must successfully complete PD-1 right. before they can register for PD-2. So when do they successfully complete PD-1? When grades are posted. Okay. So, so it's always this. Okay. And please do encourage them. We usually have this dilemma each semester where they feel like, oh, I'm already in the pipeline. I don't have to register. And so we have several that kind of sit back and feel like, I've, you know, this should be already done for me. So we should encourage them to do the paperwork stuff before. Now, yes, yeah. and they actually do enroll for each of their PD2 courses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, we, we have uh, another wonderful person who's going to come up and share some more great expertise. Dr. Bundock, we'll turn it over to you now. Okay. All right, before I get started with our paperwork business, I do, I had to apologize to Susan earlier in the semester. I felt like when I met with you all the first time around that, you know, I'm coming in taking Michael Cannell's previous position, and I have a very different management style than Michael does. And so I just come in with my own management style, and I think I kind of overstep my bounds over into Susan's role. So I do want to let you all know that Susan is maintaining her position as she always had, and I'm coming in in Michael's position, and I think we have a really great partnership, but just because my management style is different than Michael's. Uh, please know she is still your primary contact, um, and I'm always happy to talk and email with all of you. I've enjoyed that very much this semester, but Susan still is your primary contact. So know that she is maintaining her position, and I am stepping into Michael's previous position. I have a few things I want to share with you. So uh, if you all did find a packet on your way by the sign-in sheet, you're welcome to get that now. So I want to walk you through a few things in terms of paperwork because as we're anticipating an upcoming TEA visit, I'm just trying to get some things in terms of management in place and making sure we have all of our documentation where we need to be. So what I'm letting you know on your checklist is there's three sets of forms in here for most of you. The first of those forms are your inter interdisciplinary signature pages. So these are some things that you had your students or teacher candidates fill out at the first introductory session at the orientation. And what I have requested at that time is for you to return those to me. And some of you did, and some of you didn't, and I know that that's because in the past you have not resubmitted those, so I understand that. Um, so what I did for those of you that submitted these block signature pages, so I, I have scanned these and I have these on record, so that as we have conferences or we may have some issues crop up, I have access to them and I'm returning them to you today to put in your folders so you have access to them as well. So this will be an ongoing documentation process. So I recognize you haven't done this in the past, we're going to start to do this so we have this documentation in two places. So if you were able to submit that, I'm returning it to you. If not, then you probably already have it in your student folders. And I'm sorry, I missed all of that. Do I need to put them out today and I can to you? That's yeah. okay. You can have them in your folders and I'm just going to remind you at the start of next semester. Remember, we've just okay. started this documentation okay. process, okay. so thank you. I know we have, it's kind of little sprinklings of, you know, here and there, we're learning something new. So uh, you're welcome to go ahead and put these signature pages into the student folder so we'll both have record of those now. Okay, the second item on, oh, and also, there's just a few people as I was looking through your registration, if you are missing someone who is on your current roster who did not complete a signature page, I put that on <coughs> the top part of this packet for you, or I've included that in your folder. So when you go out for your second observation with that student, if you'll kind of have that on your agenda to have them go ahead and sign that signature page, recognizing we, we acknowledge these are the, the expectations in the PD semesters. So everybody will be accounted for by the end of the semester. Also, if you have paras in your, any of your blocks, any of your cohorts, I'm returning those, that paperwork to you. So all of these students have been cleared. For me, it's a three-step para approval process, and I've included their application in your packet. So know that it's at least three steps. They've got a, an application, they've got a principal verification form, and they'll also have some sort of district contract in there to acknowledge that they are employed by the district. You'll see, and some of you also have some email messages from myself to principals just confirming because some of the information on the paperwork was not clear to me. So all of that is included. So I also have this scanned, and if you could put that in your Paris folders, that would be very helpful as well. Okay, the last thing is new. 
This is new for all of us. So, this is something that I introduced to you at our initial meeting, and that is that starting this semester, TEA is requiring us to have documentation so that we can access our students' Texas test scores. So, once they're in PD1, they take their PPR, and then they go on to take their content and so forth. In the past, we've always just been able to access that information once they test with the state. Now the state is saying, we need for your students to acknowledge that you're going to be accessing this information. So Lisa Hill has worked closely with SBAC and our legal team here to create this form. It's a two-sided form, and here is the authorization to release student information. So our students are going to need to fill out this form for us this semester, and they're acknowledging that we're going to be accessing their Texas State exam. So they do some practice exams with us, but this is acknowledging their actual exam through SBEC. So I would like to request, as noted on your letter for me today, that when you go out to do your second observations, or for those of you that are still doing first observations, please, at that conference, ask the student to fill out both sides of this form and complete the form, and then you'll return that to me at our final meeting in December. And so we will have that on file so that we recognize we have uh, the authority to acknowledge these test scores. So please don't put them in this. Well, no, let me see what I said because this is a new. <laughs> let me make sure I'm giving you the correct information. Okay, you are going to put it in the student's folder. <coughs> Once the student has filled it out, you are going to keep it in their folder, and SBEC has authorized us to do that. Yes, so, other. It would be considered other. Number 12. Yes, yeah, that's I'm correct. Not, yeah. Yeah. As, an, uh, as an, another document, that's correct. So you want us to log it that way? Yes, that's that. correct. Thank you. Um, and what I'll be doing is checking in with you in December to make sure we have authorization for all of our students. And if we don't, we need to check in why is that. Can we move forward and get that from them? So as you're wrapping up your the second half of the meetings this semester, please go ahead and have them fill out both sides of this document. Do you have any questions or concerns about this okay, process? One side asked for their 900 number. Mm -hmm. The other side asked for their banner ID. Is that the same as the 900 number? I think that number? is the banner. Yes, it would be the same. Yeah, that's how we log them. Yeah. That's correct. It's their ID number. Yes, their ID number. Their student ID number. Thank you. Does it need to be in blue or black ink? I don't think that there's a preference. I think as long as it's an ink, do you It needs it? to be in blue or black ink. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's a, a One, it it's cannot be in a color ink. Yeah. yeah that would <laughs> Any other questions or comments about these, these three sets of forms? All right. Under, now, under that, I've had two additional notes. The first, uh, Viola previously addressed, and that is. Um, you've started to recognize that some of your students are having challenges. And I've spoken with some of you, and some of the things we've already conferred with students, or you've conferred, and I've backed up and said, you've had that conference, I'll follow up. If you have any students with any unsatisfactories, please let Susan and I know, because really and truly, it is so taxing on the student and on the department at the end of the semester, if we're saying you really cannot be moving forward to the next PD semester, they're really feeling shortchanged, as if it was sort of a surprise. But if we're catching them now, if we're making that plan for success, we can move them forward. Or, you know, I think worst case scenario would be they recognize this is not for them. But what we really want is to say, you can be successful, let's make a plan. Let's look at what the challenges have been and let's see how we can support you to move you forward. And that's what we truly want. So you, if you have any unsatisfactories, please let us know. We want to help you get that plan in place. And if we need to have a conference, which is probably what we'll need to do, we'll go ahead and do that where we have a group of the faculty come in and speak with the student. So that's the first item. The second item is if you are facilitating a group with PD1 and you have paras, their para application for PD2 is due to me tomorrow. And I've been in contact with them. They've received three emails from me reminding them of this date. And I don't have all the applications in yet. So if you're communicating with these PD1 pairs in the next few days, if you could sort of back me up on that and make sure that they have those applications submitted, that would be very helpful to make sure that we can move forward in that process for next semester. Do you know, know which ones you're missing? And then those are the ones I'll call at home and say, hey. Rather than put it on Blackboard and they're not going to respond for a week anyway. It's most of them. I've, I've only got four that are approved. I've got them, probably about 15 PD1 pairs. Okay. Okay. So if you happen to check in with them, that would be very helpful. And I know it's a taxing time in the semester, but I have given them about a month's notice and then I've been following up. It's, it's the exact same stuff that's right here. It right? is the same stuff. It I is the very same. Just copied it and kept it. 
Yes. <laughs> um, so do know it is the three-step process again. And I did send them the paperwork again in case they didn't have it. It's a pair application, it's a principal's verification form, and it's a copy of their district contract. And as soon as I receive it, I'm giving them an email confirmation that they've been approved for next semester. It and is a mandate that we have the forms in, and the sooner the better. I just wanted to, this is on a separate note, I don't know if anybody else has encountered this. Um, I'm working with a school in Aldine and the principal, assistant principal has requested copies of the PDOS protocol for her Title I folder. Um, is that okay for me to release that if, to the if principal? You have, the you have to have the students permission to do that? Let, let us check on that because I think we have to have students. It's going to be different for PD1 and 2 than it is for PD3, so I think we're This is for PD2. PD2. Okay. Just PD2. Let, let, let us check on that. Or I don't want to give a blanket answer to that because that's a new thing. And it is, yeah, a, it is a different expectation. Uh -huh. it's, it's, a, it's a job related. Because she said she needed it for highly qualified status. Oh, she's for her title one. Yeah. She's backing up the document. Yeah, I've got this era that's. Yeah, I have student teachers that are working with mentor teachers, I'm just but they're still and give to my student and tell and them they can print and share all they want. So sure. maybe yeah, that do it that way. Your that way. Take okay. it. Take it to her and tell her to share, because as long as she shares it, that's one thing. But if we do, that's different. We have to have paperwork. You can give the same as we can to your student, and she can go hand off all okay. that she wants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. As a matter of fact, I think the assistant principal told one of my students that she, she came and she, like, I don't know what to do because the AP requested us that I'll take care of it. So let me find out if I can do that. Yes. There may have also been a school that had student teachers previously. And since right. They or and they're required. Like the ACP they're required, required, required by law. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I just wanted to make sure I'm, yeah. I'm not violating any BARPA. Right. Yes. <laughs> but they can handle the following. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on any of this paperwork? Okay. You know, this is for, uh, is it is all the stuff supposed to be in a certain color? Because I can tell you right now, my the cap blue half Are you thinking of me? No. No. As, as long as it's not pink and purple and <laughs> orange, they can't read. Pale green, they can't be scanned. Right. Because I have my students fill out a lot of this stuff this time. Sure. So I can use blue. That's fine. Or whatever. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Bundak. We appreciate your help with, with clarifying all of the, the stuff. Take a deep breath. Everybody about there, rain dead a bit. Our and your leadership for getting us out. We feel early. Yes. <laughs> okay. So there are a couple of things just very quickly I want to go over. Pre-conference, you can do this by phone, by email, or both. But you should have pre-conference once they get you that phone, that, that uh, lesson plan. Observation usually does not require the CT to leave the classroom. We've had some issues this semester. So I'm telling you up front, because of the legal liability issues in the schools, if the schools don't feel comfortable and you don't feel comfortable, the CT can be in, or the mentor can be in the back of the classroom. Unless you agree as a group, you and the student and the, and the mentor, they can leave. All right, when you're doing that observation. Yes, I, I know that can impact. Several, I'm at a two different, well, like eight different schools this semester than from before, and, and they just started walking out. I was like, where are you going? Oh, UHD told us we're never allowed in the classroom. I was like, that's, that's no. so <laughs> In fact, I want you here because you need to give them feedback. Yeah. Plus, they're your kids. you got to know what went well, what didn't go well. Like, oh, we were told we're, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, if you really want to leave and you got, well, you know, I can't stop you. Yes. This is different. This is BD1 and 2. Student mm -hmm. teaching, we usually do ask that they leave. So maybe, maybe they're getting confused. Their, I think, I think. And, and, and so, do, yeah. and BD1 and 2, and, and it's all in the way you set it up, too, for them to feel comfortable. Post-conference should be completed by the end of that day, preferably in BD1 and 2, if you could do it right after. That would be even better. But you need to do it that day before you you leave them. Videotaping, requirements, timing, and evaluation. We are looking into the videotaping. Uh, I know there are some districts that are going to that for their teacher evaluations. Mm -hmm. We don't have all the bells and whistles and materials and even the legal aspect down yet. So we'll have to get back to you on that, but we are working and trying to figure out what can be done. Paperwork, please be consistent. Include comments and scripting notes in each of your folders in the same order. 
this, uh, we have a group that are doing some evaluation assessment for our um, uh, learning outcomes. And one of the comments was they picked up six random folders from last semester, and none of the six had the same set of papers nor the same order and organization. So the table of contents, please follow it. That table of contents isn't just to help remind you, but to keep those papers in that order, if you would, please. Yeah. Let yes. me ask a question on that. You're talking about the checklist, the very cover page. Yes, the cover page checklist. OK, so here's, here's the trick. If you're putting it in order of the checklist, it does not keep documents from your observation together. That's correct. So observation that decision one, needs two. to be very clear. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So if I'm yes, collecting a lesson plan, I have a scripting sheet, I have my own notes, and I have the PDOS. The PDOS is both, so that goes in the back. Mm -hmm. But I think I that needs to be, maybe the checklist needs to be revisited. Because okay. if, if that's what you're wanting, a mm -hmm. consistent order, then that needs to be edited. So, so you're that, saying that, that rather than having all the scripting notes together, having all the uh, observations together, you need to have observation one material. And that make a little bit more sense. And then support, okay. and then midpoint check surveys okay. and supporting documents. Okay. Because that, that's what's, that I'm sure, because I do it I, by I lessons and she she might do it by, well, I, right now it's done by lessons, but before I turn it into you at the end, I go back and do this. But okay. you're that's right, why. by I'm lessons, sure that's where it is right now because it makes more sense that way. But the few days before we come meet, I switch it all and make it match this. Yeah. But it does, it is, so yeah, so it doesn't match the lesson plan to the deal. So it doesn't match your scripting notes to your deal. Yeah, yeah. that's a good comment. Everything's stapled together for what goes together. Four and four turn it in, you have to pull all the staples out because right. you don't want them together anymore. Right, because you, you want them in this order. order. And, and you're right, it would, it would probably make a lot more sense to okay. do it so it goes in that order. You know, introductory paper. If someone had to pick it up. Lesson one, lesson two, and then supporting documents. Because I'll be honest, that's what my folder looks like right now. But that's not what it'll look like when I turn it in. Okay. And I actually I do that order with them that very last meeting. We okay. too. get everything in, a, in that order. order. Because, because we can put in the order. That seems order. It's the easiest for you okay. right now. All right. Well, we will uh, we'll talk that over in our administrative team meeting and see what, what can be done to make it a little bit easier. Thank quick, you for that feedback. Quick question. Yes, ma'am. If we have had a student that was dropped or withdrew, where do, what do we do with their folder? We Thank you for that question. If you have a student who you have paperwork in the folder, and that paperwork is, and maybe now you've had them drop, you keep that folder with you, and you must turn it in at the okay. end. We have to keep that folder. So wherever you are at that point, across your your table of contents, write dropped and the date, okay. and then sign off, and that will help me when I'm doing the check, because one of the things I get to do with the team okay. is after our meeting in December, go through and double check, because we had some folders that But you still need, to, not still need to turn out. the folder in. Yes, okay. yes, we still turn in the folder, regardless of whether they dropped mid-semester or not. Okay. If you had a folder and they didn't even show up day one, then you need to turn it in, but put a, a post-it note on front saying, never saw the student. Okay, just that's for, so that I can keep up with that. Question? Uh, that, that, that is it. Because this student was dropped prior to that day of record. But you had the folder. Right. Okay. So if you can oh. if you can put on the post-it. But it's probably mine. Is it Danny? Remember that one oh, changed? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. probably who it is. But oh, you created her a whole new folder because, because I didn't know, know where we I didn't know where the folder was. I bet that's But then I, I received a new one and so I just took her label off of Okay, so that, that, that one I'll come no out on. She just so she sectional okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I don't have Sandra's. Sandra. Sandra. I don't have a folder. She's a pair. Yeah, I know that name. So she's okay. one that I had that was dropped from my class only because she's switching sections That's and went to a different one. All right, but you still have her folder? I probably have the yellow part. That's what I meant, the yellow folder? Because she never got a folder, so we need to do something. We'll talk about that after. Yeah, she said she okay. filled it out and someone has it. Yeah. But she filled out with yeah the, the signature page. Yeah. Okay, then, then we'll talk about that later. Same thing with Janelli. I think it's Sanchez's. Or yes, it is. Janelli. Mm -hmm. Okay, class meetings.
How many of you have done at least one more class meeting with your group? Mine's still two. Yours is tonight? Two. Okay. How many of you have at least one still to go? Well, the last one. The last one. The last one, the last one, the last one right? Okay. How many of you are going to try? Excuse me. <clears throat> and do that last one like December 5th or 6th or somewhere Sixth. right about right before our before our December 9th meeting? Six. Before Thanksgiving. Six, right before Thanksgiving? Okay, that's fine. Yes. But Thanksgiving's late this year, so that's yeah. no problem. Okay, I just want to check with where everybody is. Well, I'd love to know that for the future because I didn't know how late we could go, so we're November 22nd. That's but, fine. But it would have been nice. Can we do it that late in the year? When, I, when you meet that first day with me, and I usually give you the whole semester of meetings, as long as it's prior to our turn it in meeting, okay. which is December 9th this time, it, okay. it's up to you. It's you said November on their registration. I know, it's so yeah. I check the so, my students. Yeah, so that's, that's why, why I check the my students. If, if the little yellow box on the uh, course place tells them they're going to have a meeting in September, October, and November, then we try to keep it on the, in those months. So I did the if, last day of November. That's good. <laughs> okay. That's good. Okay. Any communications? Anything that I need to know? Yeah. Things that uh, that you, besides the changing the folder outline, uh, cover page, that you think would be nice to have uh, changed or at least looked at for next semester? The template folder that Aurora has, I brought to her attention the two missing paperwork pieces, the script and the conference form. Mm -hmm. They're different than the updated. So the conference okay, they form. They need to be updated. Yeah, I think you just need to make sure you like the conference form because I think it's different. Wait, which one are you talking about? Aurora has the, the template. She has the master folder, and I just copied it, and she's still missing some stuff in there. So I, I brought it to her attention. Um, they're also on the uh, on Blackboard Learn under the organization that you're part of, the PD1 and 2, but I need to check and make sure those are updated, too. Okay. So now that you're saying that, I'm not sure. I may have just... Remember how that happened the first meeting, and right. we tried to correct it, but... Uh, Okay, mentors. How many of you have new mentors and you have not yet really done a training with them? I must I have that means. eleven new schools. That it's one from here, one from there, one from there. So just let it go. yeah, that uh, intro letter though was perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know I have to say that's the first time I, that was you know because I have a kick up form and I included that letter with that and that really helped. Okay, okay. good. Well, I have I have been. Yeah, I, 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 I had the experience that at uh, one of my schools, it was a new principal. We have several. And, and, oh, you know, the first week it was chaotic because I don't think she had ever dealt with a program like this. Mm -hmm. And so she was giving the students, and first she put them all in one room, and then she spoke to them and told them, well, go walk around and find a mentor. A mentor. Wow. And so the teachers had no idea. And so one of my students called me and said, Dr. Flores. So I ran out to the school and I calmed them down. I said, don't worry about it. She's a new principal. You will get a mentor. You know, and, and everything worked out. But uh, I know all these new mentors for the first time. Okay. So we'll talk, we, we can talk about the training and the materials because most of it is like the letter. I tried to put things that you could use really uh, down and dirty, simple, that you are not going to be pulling your hair out trying to do multiple uh, trainings in depth. At one time, we used to do in depth training for the mentors. And uh, we decided it really didn't help because A, they didn't have the time. And B, we don't have the funds to give you money to buy them drinks and things and, <laughs> uh, like we used to. So we tried to make it simple and, and sweet. Yes. Sue, and then, okay. Go ahead. I have one AP who, today, as of today, still has not given me the mentor names or emails. Oh. And so I've had to go behind her back, which that, I mean, we don't want to do, but and remember, I didn't turn in my form. So you have to go behind their back sometimes. And I have documents of how many times I've asked the car on the phone. <coughs> This, you mean from the student? I have one principal that I've worked with yeah. forever. She never sends me the list, so I just tell the students, text me when you get there. And, cause she, and it's really no big deal. I think it's just the way she's trying to, like, because, oh, I got it, I got it. And it's so when they check in, she gives it. to ask the principal, 
do you mind if I email your, your mentors directly from here on out? Right. That's a politeness. But if I can't even get that back, I'm like, yeah. okay, we'll be talking. But I have one mentor inside her I've worked with for six years or whatever, and she just handles it. I think she thinks she's helping me, but yeah. then I have to figure it out. Okay, so one thing, Ken, it would be really nice, I think, and Jenny will agree with this, if you could do a letter similar to your letter, that was a great letter, but adjust it a little to go to a principal for Paris. Because their situation oh, is a yes. tad different. That's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. So if we had something consistent to give to that, because Janine and I are in it together. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I used to do that when I was a block coordinator. I'd right. email and yeah. it was a li I would think yeah. something just a little bit different that goes to a parent. Because okay. we had a PD1, PD2, and so yes. the principal was like, well, last semester, this semester, and this semester. And just a little different. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, it, and it is different, and it's hard for them to understand. And yeah. this was a principal that was new and yeah. never had, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scheduling times and locations, Dr. Garcia mentioned this. This semester we had a few students who were stressed out because um, they you know, understand, students tell us things, and it's just like, you told mom this, you told dad this, but they were saying, oh, I can only go on Monday, I can only go on Friday. My, my supervisor can't see me unless I go on these hours, and that, that's I understand you've got multiple people to do, but the students have to set up a schedule that's convenient for the mentor and that they can work with while, especially those who are going to day classes. Um, we do have a day class that meets on Friday morning, and then Monday mornings usually we don't because that's our faculty meeting day, but if you have a group of students and there's some that want to go all day Tuesday or Wednesday, what we used to do in the old program was they only went Mondays and Fridays because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday were the class days during the day. Now that we've moved from that program to where most of our, our classes are at night, that's no longer an issue. They're not interfering with their classes. Main thing that we really want to make sure is that you as the supervisor are aware of where your students are and that it isn't uh, well, the first hour is the kids go to PE. The second hour is uh, computer, lab. computer lab. The third hour, oh, it's already lunchtime. And they're going three hours every morning, Mondays and Fridays or Tuesdays and Thursdays. And all they're seeing is computer lab, right. basically. So that's the big thing, the big yes. challenge for that. And most of our students are pretty good and they yeah. don't try to... But now, that's different though, if they've already told you what their class schedule is. So like, I have a section who can only do observations on Mondays and Fridays. Well, yeah, that, that's, okay. that's fine. The day group? The day group, that's the way it'll be because okay. they meet Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Almost. Right. Okay. But for the ones who are taking night classes and they're having to schedule around, uh, for a lot of them, we tell them if you need a job, substitute. This is a good time to substitute. And Fridays, they really need you. so. Sign up and you only substitute on Fridays. And then you say, no, you've got to go to the classes on Fridays. You've got to go to your mentor on Friday. Yes. One concern that uh, we've had on uh, our campus is that in fourth and fifth grade, they are semi-departmentalized. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, with the uh, students doing uh, one lesson in the reading and one in the math, one of the person, either one of those teachers is not a established right. mentor but we were able to go on and make the adjustments so that our student would still be working consistently with that same group of students. And so that other teacher was very um, amenable to, you know, following through with that. And so uh, it, it worked out. But that, that was a concern. That is a new challenge for even for us in student teaching. Because who gets the credit? Well, who gets the credit? I have no problem with you turning in two mentor names for those, and we'll give them each a CTE letter. But the second part of that is, especially when they get to student teaching, they're being certified as a generalist. If they're in a departmentalized environment, and they're only teaching science and math all day, or math all day, <clears throat> we have a, a problem with that. So get them set and get them used to the idea of switching like that so that when they go to student teaching, it's a no-brainer. They, they set that up immediately. Well, do the principals understand that, though? Because the principals are signing them. No, they yeah. have And our fifth grade, third, no, fourth and fifth are departmentalized. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Before, it was easy to make sure that if it went from a reading that was bilingual and, and a writing that was bilingual to math that was bilingual. Now, the math is not bilingual. It's a regular teacher. So what happens there? Ooh, that's a whole next bilingual block to PD2. Yeah. And so that's a whole different, we need to talk about that after the fact, after the meeting. But it even happens I'm, with the PD1s and 2s because they, the principal signs, yes, I agree, this student will be six hours, blah, 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 but it's an hour and a half per day in bilingual math. Mm -hmm. Did it say on the principal's letter, do they understand that? I don't know. So that, that's why we need that letter. That, because they're saying, that, I understand it. Well, that's not what we meant. So, okay, all right, because in general, like, okay, I'm reading language, she's math. I mean, mine, and they really just, all they're doing is going over there to teach, teach that, that one lesson. lesson. Yeah. Even my mentors have really been helping them do the lesson. But they may walk over there and say, hey, what do you want me to teach? Right. So I still think that one mentor should get the credit. Right? They're not really getting that much credit. Okay. Right? I mean, if, it would that, only be if they're, if if they're constantly going. Yeah. 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 Let's, leave, let's leave up our recommendation. I think that's a good idea. The kids all day. And then, like, I had one situation, you know, we're saying I'm reading in math, but she went over and the partner was less than cordial, so she's just doing student reading language, and we have that ability, right? And that's a flexibility issue. The only thing we need to be aware of is some of these students are being, their classes they're taking, for example, I teach at site. My students have to do a, a developmental description of a child that they do in the mentor classroom. And they have to ask permission. They have a letter they take to the mentor to say, I'm going to be observing a child. These are the things that I'm going to be looking for. It's for a paper for the PED 3305. And I'm not asking, I don't ask permission for my students. I just tell them, I give them the details. In math, some of the math professors are requiring they show evidence that they taught a math lesson mm -hmm. in those right. things. And they so, but it's no different than like they take early literacy the first, and the, I have some that are in fifth grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. So they have to go seek out a young child that's to make sure that. And that's that's right. Right. So sometimes that. that's right. Okay. Yes. So it just kind of depends. That's how you prepare them for this. Right. Time. Absolutely. As it's long the as there, as long as everything, I mean, as long as the students not feeling overly stressed because. Right. My math faculty told me this. My reading faculty told me this. Now you're telling me this. And right. Like, ah, what do I do? It does happen. And mm -hmm. then, then we're okay. But if it's stressful, guess what? That's part of your job. You're a firefighter. You get to put out those fires. One, one of the issues, and this doesn't apply to this group as much, but when our student teaching situation, we're going to have to address this spring what we're going to do with those junior high middle school assignments. Because, for example, this semester I have someone who's assigned to only science and we're having to rotate into a language arts and a math to give core coverage. And it's such a space. And when they're going to do their two weeks, it's going to be in science and then they're having to pick up a week of math or work around the math lesson for us. So we're going to have to address some issues yeah. in the spring. This is for the 4th through 8th This is 4th through yes. 8th certification, yeah, because they put, they either have to put them in 4th and 5th, even then it's right. And literally what we're doing is an, the 8th grade student teacher for science is going to go into the 6th grade readless class, and the 6th grade readless teacher, student teacher is going to go into the 8th grade, and then we have a 3rd teacher who's going to cover math for them. But it's, and we're trying yeah. to get an observation in every one of those subjects. And it's, to it's, it's comfortable so I can say and, this is the record. And that's right. And from the flip side, you can understand that's pretty accommodating for teachers and principals yeah. to already to oh, be willing yeah. to do that. Yeah. So the more we have to do wow. that. Wow. Sounds like we've got a lot of good things to work on. <laughs> and uh, it's already passed. But we've come a long way. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. So when is our next meeting? December 9th at 1. What and we're going to be at C210. I have another. Oh, we have another other. She, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped other, but Dr. Bud, has have found another. I apologize. This just occurred to me because it was just finalized. I have our orientation date set for next semester. So it's going to, all of the orientations will take place on Tuesday, January 7th. 
before the semester starts again and that really helped us to get placed because we had our criminal background checks in early so mm -hmm. I am going to continue and hope that we have some good Tuesday, January 7th yeah Tuesday January 7th day and night time. yes we'll have if you are teaching a downtown section the morning section will be here at 8 30 a.m. the evening section will be here at 5 30 p.m. If you are doing a Northwest section, it will be at Northwest at 5.30 p.m. And if you're at Kingwood, it will be at Kingwood at 5.30 p.m. Before they start, and I don't know if it's PD-1 or PD-2, is it possible to have one professor from the department do a training on the lesson plan? They get it in, their, in a lot of their pre-PD courses. They get it, but it needs to be uniform because we're, we're still having those and the only way you're going to fix that is by having them in you know, one place, in one time, or whatever, what? go over. I can do that. I have no problem doing yeah, that. Thing about that. We need to be careful that, because that is the, it is di uh, directed towards certain courses. So we, we, we need to touch base with the powers that be and make sure that it's not overstepping our... If you have a departmental lesson plan that has been voted on, which it has been, which it, has. it needs to be consistent, and it's oh. not. It's what, not. What about where are we on the iPad version that Janice and oh, it, it is acceptable. In my, some, in my in my PED 3305, I introduced it, and I had two students that got on there. They love it, and they're typing in. And are all the the areas match exactly. They don't. I had, no. I had someone turn it in. in. Where did she left it out like nine yeah. areas. So that's, uh, that's and that's I was amazing. like, wait a minute. No, it, it's it, 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 it's not because she left out nine areas that they aren't there. It's that she left out nine areas because you have to go into each section separately, and they may not have gone into each section. Well, separately. I went and said, oh, what you did is fabulous, but not these <laughs> areas. <laughs> Okay, well, can we get access to that? Mm -hmm. I need to find out from Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Tillman down. Tillman and, down. And Janice, is Janice using it too or no? I don't know. Well, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Too, okay, because okay. like they home. talked to us about it right. together. Or something. Yeah. Well, it's not that it was bad. It's just yeah. we told them you had to do it this way. And then, and and then, then it has not. a little bit less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So she's giving you the dates. Thank you, yes, ma'am. I have a question. I have what is it? Four students who are pregnant. <laughs> wow, something in the water. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, no. and so are they not going to be able to finish the semester? And no, the three of them are going to do okay. I hope. If I mean, one is due in November. Okay. Uh, okay. But one is due in February. And, and so. We'll, we'll, that's a whole different world. We'll talk about that. Okay, thank you very much.